Hi, I'm Alex Grieve, better known as IB Crazy from Video Aerial Systems, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to build the Spark airplane. The Spark is everything a trainer should be. It's light, inexpensive, easy to build, easy to fly, and perhaps most importantly, it's very, very durable. When built properly, the spark can be crashed time and time again and just bounces back. Okay, so what do you get in the kit? Well, of course you're going to get the foam, which includes a single piece fuselage and a four piece foam wing with the polyhedral already cut. You're going to get two fiberglass spars. You're going to get a two piece tail assembly. You're going to get a tube of glue. You're also going to get clevises, a threaded rod linkage, and of course, control horns. And finally, you're even going to get laminating film, enough to cover the whole airplane. The laminating film will make the airplane a little bit faster, but it will make it much more durable. However, if you want it to go to an absolute crawl, the drag of the foam without this will slow it down a bit. One thing to note about the Spark airplane is it does not require a substantial power system. The aircraft was designed for a 1300 to 1600 three cell LiPo. This motor is a 2204 1650 kV spinning a 6x55 prop. Just about any multi, mini multi-rotor motor will do well with this airplane so long as the KV rating is somewhere between 1600 and 2000 KV. It can spin either a 5 or a 6 inch prop, either will do. This particular setup will fly on as little as an amp and a half, which means theoretically with a video system on it, you could fly it for up to 45 minutes on a single battery charge, which means the range capability of this airplane is close to 10 miles. There's a bit of a story behind this airplane. This airplane came from a conversation between Jeremiah of Stone Blue Airlines and I in early of 2014 where he asked if it was possible that I could design a inexpensive, highly durable trainer airplane. And of course, this is what I came up with. Now, you might wonder, well, is not is that really the tail that comes with it? Well, sort of. Jeremiah took a few extra rudder sections from some specters that he made and put them on the tail to make a very unique tail. I personally prefer the center rudder. That's how I designed the airplane. It was supposed to be a rudder elevator only airplane as it is intended to be a trainer aircraft. Now you might, now again, you might be saying, well, is that the rudder that really comes with it? Well, yes, except I just cut the bottom off to make it a very, very lazy flyer. The rudder that comes with it actually has a bottom section to it. And what this does is makes the airplane curve and roll as if it had ailerons. And believe it or not, it'll actually do a barrel roll quite nicely, yet still be able to right itself. Yeah, so while it might be a trainer, it sure performs a lot better than most trainer airplanes do. Start out your build by gluing the wings together. Add a copious amount of glue to the mating surface of one of the wings. Then press them together firmly and work them around to be sure the glue is spread. If you like, you can use your finger to spread the glue around both surfaces. Once done, press them back together and then pull them back apart and put them to the side. The glue is a contact adhesive and will be bonded later. Cut our spars. Cut one spar in half, that is 24 inches long, and then cut the other spar into three equal pieces 16 inches long. The 24 inch sections will go into the wing and the 16 inch sections will go into the tail of the fuselage. Now is a good time to start laminating the fuselage. Cut the laminating film so that it extends beyond the fuselage approximately one inch. Set a covering iron or a clothing iron to a temperature approximately 250 degrees and using adequate pressure, press down and bond the film. The shiny side goes out. The inside, the opaque side, is the adhesive. Once done, flip the fuselage over, 
pull the laminating film tight like I have shown here and repeat the process. Again, the shiny side should be out, the opaque side should be in. This is a thermally activated adhesive and should bond very securely to the EPP. If it doesn't appear to be bonding, you can turn up the heating iron a little bit. EPP takes a fair amount of heat to distort and thus you can use quite a bit of heat for quite a bit of margin of error. Now it's time to trim up the laminating film. Using a very sharp utility knife or similar knife, cut around the edges of the fuselage where it begins to curve away from the laminate, being careful not to cut into the laminate where it's bonded into the fuselage. This will be folded over to make a somewhat neat fold. Once done, cut off the excess laminating film as this will roll up and tend to get in the way. You need to leave about two inches or so of extra film above the top of the fuselage. Now it's time to bond the bottom of the fuselage. Just like the sides, apply a copious amount of heat and move the covering iron up and down the fuselage using adequate pressure to get the laminating film to bond. Once complete, flip over the fuselage and pull the laminating film across the top and bond to the top of the fuselage. Once bonded, take your knife and cut through the center of the laminating film. You will then fold this in towards the fuselage, one piece over top of the other, and bond them to the airframe. This is going to wrinkle up a little bit and the laminating film should somewhat smooth out, but as far as I can tell, there's no way to make this perfect. Now it's time to revisit the wing. The adhesive should have cured up nicely by now. So align the tips, then press the wings together solidly. Now we can add our spars to the wing. Using a straight edge placed across the thickest part of the wing, make a, a very thin slice into the wing approximately 1 8 to 3 16 of an inch deep. You don't want to cut all the way through the wing here, you just want to make a slice for your fiberglass rod. Then take your glue and inserting the tip into the slot, inject a copious amount of glue into the slot. You want to see the glue overflow from the slot as you place it in there. Now take your fiberglass rod and embed it into that slot. I find it is best to bend up the fiberglass rod and press it in bit by bit. Do not slide your fingers down the fiberglass rod, otherwise the fiberglass could end up in your skin and will give you an itch you will never forget. Now, flip the wing over and repeat the exact same procedure in approximately the same location. This doesn't have to be perfect. Again, inject a copious amount of glue into the slot and then again embed your fiberglass rod. Next, bond up the wing tips. Again, add a copious amount of glue to the tip of the wing Press it on to the main wing, working it around slightly to make sure you've got a good coating of glue. And again, I like to wipe the glue with my fingers to verify that it's well coated. Again, repeat the process on the other side, just like you did before. And when complete, put the wing to the side, leaving the wing tips disconnected. Again, this is a contact adhesive and it's going to take some time to get ready before we can bond it up. Now we're going to embed the three spars in our tail. Measure back three inches 
and make a mark on each side and the bottom of the fuselage. Use your spars to line up along the fuselage. You want it up to be approximately in the middle of the tail. Then make a mark where the spar stops on the fuselage. Now, using a straight edge and a knife, again, cut a slot approximately 1 8 to 3 16 of an inch deep between these two marks. The bottom can be a little bit tricky, so be sure you're able to hold the straight edge straight and not cut your thumbs off when making this incision. Again, just like the wing, inject a copious amount of glue into the slot. Then take your fiberglass rod and embed it into the slot in the fuselage. Do this to both sides and to the bottom of the fuselage. Next up, the tail assembly. You're going to make two very shallow incisions side by side into a single flute. You want to choose the flute just forward of the center point of the rudder, where I have shown here. Repeat this for the top and bottom. Pull that small sliver of plastic out and you will have a very nice hinge. Now you can clean up any imperfections by simply folding the unit in half and taking a utility knife and trimming it off. We'll do the same for the tail. Count one flute back from the apex of the curve and again remove one side of one flute, being very careful not to cut too deep and go into the other side of the coroplast. Again, we can trim this up by folding in half and slicing our excess off with our knife. To install the tail, first cut a notch about half of an inch deep into the back of the fuselage and then dig it out with a pen or other utensil. Add a little bit of glue into this slot, as well as to the underside of the airplane's elevator. You don't need to use a whole lot here, but be sure you have enough for an adequate bond. Then, placing the rudder into the back of the fuselage, press the elevator section onto the wing, then remove it and let it dry. It's now time to laminate the wing. I used two cut two by fours to support the wing so I wouldn't crush the polyhedral tips. Spread your laminate over the tips of the wing, being sure to extend it approximately one inch beyond the tips. You'll want the laminating film to hang over the back approximately half an inch, just enough so you're sure that you're not going to be short once you fold over the top. This is similar to laminating the fuselage. Again, use the iron at about 250 degrees or so. Press firmly into the wing and starting from the center out, work the laminating film into the foam. Now I stopped once I got to the wing tips until I did the other side completely. In doing the wing tips, I simply lifted up the wing to support it with my hand and then move the laminating iron down the wing to be sure I had a bond that wouldn't stress or stretch the angle of the polyhedral tip. 
flip the wing over and cut off any excess laminating film to make sure that it doesn't get in the way when laminating the top. Take your knife and cut a slit down the center of the laminating film so it could fold over the wing properly. Again, hold it as tight as you can to the leading edge of the wing and then starting from the center of the wing, work your way to the wing tip. In the back of the wing, you want to bond the laminating film to the, the half inch that hung off the back side. This will make sure it's easy to trim off later on. Once one side is bonded, go ahead and bond the other side. Trim off the excess laminating film with a utility knife. For the back portion, you might want to cut just about an eighth of an inch into the foam. What this does is this gives you a nice clean finish on the back side of the wing, though the truth is it doesn't affect performance hardly at all. Once that is done, go ahead and trim off the excess on the tips of the wing. To bond the wing to the fuselage, open up the wing cavity and apply a proper amount of glue to both the top and the bottom surface as well as the back to be sure that it bonds fully as one piece. Slide the wing in being sure to center it up and press down firmly. You can use the glue as a contact adhesive or instead, you can simply do what I did here and simply add some weight and let it dry for three to four hours. Before installing the motor, you have to verify that you have adequate clearance with the prop. Install the propeller on the motor and then put the motor on the plane where it belongs. Place your finger underneath the blade of the prop to verify that there is enough clearance and that the pl blade will not strike the fuselage. Then take your wooden motor mount and add a, a very large amount of glue and then stick it to the back of the fuselage, working it around, then remove it. The servos here are glued in. Add a little bit of glue to the bottom and the back side of your rudder servo and place it towards the front of the rudder far, as far away from the hinge as possible. This servo helps to support the tail and keep it from rocking in flight. Repeat this same process with the elevator servo. The elevator servo gets mounted to the foam right in front of the tail section. It doesn't matter which side the servos are mounted so long as the control horns will line up. Installing the control horns requires a thin pointy object. In my case, I'm using a small eyeglass screwdriver. Place the control horn close to the hinge. You want to be one flute back behind the hinge. Press the screwdriver through the hole in the control horn all the way down through both surfaces of the tail assembly. Then using one of the securing screws, press it down through your new made hole. Then again, use the eyeglass screwdriver or whatever pointy object you've selected and push through the other side. Again, use the other securing screw to hold it in place. Once installed, move the hinge to be sure you have adequate motion. Repeat this same process for the rudder assembly. Again, line up your control hinge approximately at the apex of the hinge, but one flute back. Verify that it moves freely, then using a sharp pointy object, press it through both sides of the fluted section. Again, use one of the screws to secure it in place, and then repeat with the other hole. You'll need to use a securing plate to hold the control horn in place. It's a small rectangular plastic piece with two holes in it. Drive your screws into the plate and turn it approximately four to five turns at a time. Then set the other screw into the other hole and again, turn it four to five times. Alternate between screws, turning four to five times a piece to walk the plate all the way back to the control surface. 
If you over tighten one side too much, it could stress out the tail section and make for a loose joint. At this point, the glue should be dry on the servos and the motor mount to mount them in place. Simply line the servo up with the control horn, or at least close to it, and press it in place. Repeat this for the rudder. Again, you want the rudder servo to be tightly wedged between the elevator and the rudder section to give it additional support and to keep the servo from waddling around. Now for the motor mount, again, just square it up to the eye, that should be good enough, and press it in place. Be sure to press the motor mount in very good and tight and then move it around with your hands to verify that it is fully cured and it's not going to come loose. The threaded rod and the clevises make the linkage between the elevator and rudder and their respective servos. Start out by screwing a clevis into the threaded rod, then connect it into your servo, as, as I'm showing here. Then, using a pair of diagonals, bolt cutters, or whatever utensils happen to be available, take that and cut off the threaded rod approximately half the length of a clevis away from the surface which you intend to cut. Your other clevis and screw it into the end of the threaded rod so that it lines up with your control horn. Now I'm using the top of the control horn here. The further down on the control horn you go, the more reactive the airplane will be. Since I like my airplanes to be fairly docile, as this is supposed to be a relaxing flyer, I'm going to use the top hole. Repeat this same procedure on the other side to connect your rudder. With the servo approximately 90 degrees, you want the rudder to be approximately straight. We'll trim this up on our maiden flight, so get it close enough to the eye, at least for now. The motor is installed with basic wood screws, which often come with most motors. In my case, they actually came with my Emacs motor. Screw the screws securely into the wood. Leave them a little bit loose until you get all four screws in to verify that the system lines up with the holes. If the pre-cut holes don't work, you can simply use a 1 16th inch drill bit and drill through the plate to make room for another screw. Now to mount the speed control, I simply used welder adhesive, again, because I have plenty left. Of course, you could use tape or whatever else you want. I'm using a 12 amp speed control as this particular setup only pulls about four and a half to five amps. Again, we're gonna use it as a contact adhesive, so press it down and then pull it off and we'll re-adhere it later. I mounted my receiver underneath the wing as it seemed to be the most convenient place. And because I'm using 72 megahertz, I don't want my antenna to be caught in my propeller. And thus, I'm simply running the antenna out the wing. Of course, 72 megahertz, it's good to keep the antenna as straight as possible. However, a 39 inch antenna doesn't fit very well on a 36 inch wing. So when I made it out to the wing tip, I simply turned the antenna 90 degrees taped it on, and that should be good enough for the range I intend to fly this airplane. The servo wires will need to be secured to the side of the tail section. This ensures that they will not get cut by the spinning propeller. I'm just using a piece of packing tape to hold them in place, but some people prefer to take a knife and, and scrape down the side of the fuselage and embed them inside the tail for a cleaner look. Either way works, but I'm being lazy in this step and, well, I fully intend to bash this thing around and beat it up, so the ugliness will get throughout the rest of the airplane in no time. You're likely going to need some servo extensions to make it to your receiver. In my case, six inches of servo extension was plenty. Of course, I could have moved the receiver back further into the tail, however, I really like it under the wing and I happen to have the servo extensions, so I just did it this way. We connect our servo leads to our receiver. The rudder servo will go into the aileron channel as this aircraft is not designed to have ailerons. However, should you have ailerons cut into the airplane, of course the rudder would go into the rudder channel, which is usually channel 4. 
set up the airplane for the battery. Measure two and one half inches back from the front of the wing and make a mark. You will place your fingers on these marks and the plane should balance there to ensure that the center of gravity is right. Gravity is set by the battery. Take a piece of packing tape and tape the battery somewhere on the nose of the aircraft. Then, placing your fingers on the two marks you made under the wing, lift up on the airplane. If the nose rises in the air and the tail sinks, you need to move the battery forward. If the nose drops, then you need to move the battery backwards. Once you get the plane to balance, mark where the battery rests on the fuselage. In my case, the battery was three inches back from the nose and I'm using a 1500 milliamp hour three cell battery. Now untape the battery and place it between the two marks you've made on the fuselage and then trace all the way around the battery to get its contour. Once you've done that, take your knife and cut out this section, attempting to keep it as flat as possible. Chances are you're going to need a knife with a very long blade or possibly remove the blade and grab it with a pair of pliers to get it all the way through the fuselage. Once the section is cut out, press out the foam as gently as possible, trying not to damage anything on the way through. Then install your battery in your newly made battery chamber. It should fit in there very tight, very snug. To secure the battery, you can use anything from tape to a rubber band, or in the case you made the chamber very tight, friction alone is more than enough to hold the battery in place. Once you've verified it's in place, Pull it out and add reinforcement. I'm using what's left of my welder adhesive in the corners here to add reinforcement to the chamber. The reason to do this is to add strength as the battery bay is the weakest point of the airplane and thus in a hard crash this is where it's likely to split. Adding a little bit of this glue keeps the foam from separating and makes the plane a lot more durable. Again, you're going to have to wait about 8 to 10 hours to let this dry before you're ready for your maiden flight. That's about all there is to it. I'll leave it to you to figure out where you want to put video gear should you want to convert this into an FPV airplane. However, once the glue is dry, you're ready to go take your first flight. Don't be too nervous about it. Remember, this thing was meant to crash. So, even if it's not perfect, you've got plenty of time to play with it. Have fun and keep your wings in the sky.